name is Dr. John Bennett, broadcasting from Miami Beach, home of Neurosurgical TV. I have the honor today of hosting a, a webcast about uh, the Chinese Neurosurgical Journal, the international or English edition. Uh, we here at Neurosurgical TV cover most of the countries uh, by webcasting in education, and this is part of our education. So. First, I'll introduce uh, Wan Li from Beijing Tiatin Hospital. He's going to uh, run the show. Welcome, Wan Li. Hi, uh, thank you, John. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, tonight, we, we start our uh, special uh, channel from the Neurosurgical TV. Uh, so uh, tonight, we will uh, have some uh, speakers to introduce the Chinese Neurosurgical Journal. It's an English language uh, <clears throat> version journal to uh, <clears throat> talk about uh, everything in and neuro, about neurosurgery. But it's a uh, it name is Chinese New Journal, but actually it's an international journal, and we uh, uh, cooperated by, uh, with the uh, the international uh, publisher, the Biomed Central Spring Nature uh, Publisher. So uh, tonight, uh, at first uh, we would like to uh, uh, invite uh, uh, Dr. John Bernard to uh, give uh, some introduction about this neurosurgical TV. Okay, John. Sure, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, yeah, we started basically uh, six years ago using uh, the video platform of Google Hangouts, who was the predecessor of uh, of what we know as Zoom. Uh, Zoom started in, in about 2018, it started impacting. Uh, once that started, the demand for videos was uh, increased by 20 times. It went up 200% the, the use of Zoom. Uh, and people got used to it. Uh, and now they, they uh, we have webcasts from uh, uh, South America, uh, not too many from, uh, from Europe, uh, India, Pakistan, and uh, Africa. Uh, and we welcome uh, the connection with the Chinese Neurosurgical Journal. Uh, and we hope to uh, expose to the, to the publishing world of neurosurgery uh, what they do. Uh, it can do nothing but help, help discussion in neurosurgery and improve neurosurgery, I think, in all areas to be able to, uh, to include China more closely to the West. Uh, and I feel that the, uh, uh, the use of this video platform is an excellent way. Uh, it makes it personal. You get to know the people. Uh, I know a lot of the people on the panel. I'm just a regular doctor, not a neurosurgeon, but I've met the, the finest neurosurgeons in the world. Uh, and one thing I've seen that neurosurgeons are, like because I was tra not trained as a neurosurgeon, but I could see uh, neurosurgeons love to teach. Uh, this part of the DNA, I think, of a neurosurgeon. Uh, they just love to teach. They always seem to find time. Um, and of course, there's work for us, but of course, there's always room for uh, education. So uh, thank you, Wan Lee. I'll turn it back to you. Okay, thank you, John. So now uh, we, we start this uh, special webinar and it will be uh, hosted by uh, Professor Bing Shi from Shanghai Huashan Hospital and, um, and me. So uh, uh, at first I would like to give a, a <clears throat> short introduction about this journal uh, on behalf of Professor uh, Ji Zhong Zhao, the editor in chief of this journal. Uh, so uh, he's supposed uh, already online, but it uh, seems there's still uh, some uh, small problem with the, uh, with the internet connection. So uh, never mind. we can just uh, start introduction and wait him online. So this Chinese neurosurgical journal uh, <coughs> start, let me see. 
Yeah, this is a <clears throat> this is a, a new journal start in um, year twenty fifteen, and uh, it's uh, published every three weeks. So uh, <clears throat> the publisher is Chinese Medical Association, and the co-publisher is uh, our Beijing Tiantan Hospital, and also the Chinese Neurosurgical Society. And we uh, uh, cooperated with the Biomed Center of uh, Spring uh, Springer Nature, and it served as an academic forum for not only Chinese neurosurgeons but also the international. Uh, neurosurgeons, especially for a uh, young neurosurgeon for the uh, communication. And this is our editor board. We have the editor in chief is the professor Ji Zhong Zhao. He's the he's academician of Chinese Academy of Science, and also the department chairman of Beijing Tiantan Hospital. So we have uh, Dr. Yu Ha here, and we also have some other uh, famous uh, neurosurgeon like uh, Professor Poon is also our uh, <coughs> deputy editor in chief. And then some other uh, famous neurosurgeon like uh, Professor uh, Takashi Kawa and uh, uh, Professor Spetzer, Professor Harry Brown from John Hopkins. Mm. And uh, we uh, published uh, we have the submission uh, start from 2015, and uh, now there are uh, around 200 submission every year. And uh, we can uh, last year we published uh, uh, 50 articles. So the accept acceptance rate is about uh, 30, <clears throat> 20, 30 percent. Uh, that's the monthly data. Uh, every uh, we just have uh, it seems that we have more uh, submission during uh, September October right and uh, the article types uh, the, for the all <coughs> submissions we have uh, 307 case report and uh, accept 71 and we have a research article 371 and accept 135 and the uh, review article 105 submission and 46 uh, accepted so there is that this this is the uh, submission by country we have about 60% from uh, mainland China, but we also have uh, like 5% uh, from the uh, United States, 4% from India, and then other countries uh, like Turkey, uh, Indonesia, Egypt, Pakistan, Russian Federation, and others. Um, According to the, the internet, internet uh, visiting data from the Biomed Center uh, website, uh, <clears throat> now we have more than uh, 300,000 uh, uh, visiting for our uh, published, uh, online published articles. So uh, since we have already uh, be uh, accepted by the PubMed uh, Med Central. So it's uh, more easy to, to get the, the full text articles. So here is the top 10 uh, accessed articles in all the years. So like uh, a minimal invasive surgery approach to the treatment of uh, piriformis uh, syndrome. If this is a case, a case series. We have more than 60,000 downloads. And uh, some others like drug treatment of vasospasm uh, after subarachnoid hemorrhage following aneurysm. Uh, so it's focused uh, on uh, every uh, subspecialties of your surgery. This is the uh, <clears throat> citation. 
we uh, according to the web of science uh, data we have uh, start from uh, 2017 we have citation for our published uh, articles so uh, this is the top 10 cited articles published in all the years so the uh, the most uh, <coughs> uh, the, the article have the, the the most citation is the treatment uh, drug treatment of cerebral vasospasm after subarachnoid hemorrhage following aneurysm and uh, we have some others from uh, Hong Kong from uh, uh, United States and uh, from uh, Japan. Uh, here is the top 10 uh, cite, uh, cited articles published in year 2020 and 2021. Uh, the pr uh, prevalence of breathing of uh, gains in Parkinson's disease and in patients with different disease duration and uh, severity, uh, <coughs> severities. Uh, this is from, uh, I think it's from Tiantan Hospital, yeah, and some others. So uh, our journal currently <coughs> uh, covered by the following uh, database, uh, like uh, DOAG, the Google Scholar, PubMed, and PubMed Central, and uh, Scoops. Uh, the <clears throat> the H five index uh, for the Google Scholar it's uh, star increased from four to eight in twenty twenty, and uh, according to the site score uh, twenty twenty, we have uh, zero point six uh, uh, score of the the citation <clears throat> rank. Uh, the submission by the country or region, uh, you can see uh, we have more than 50% from uh, China, but also 40 from uh, United States, six, uh, 36 from India and uh, Iran, Iraq, Turkey, Indonesia, Egypt, Parkinson, uh, Pakistan, Russia, Germany, Colombia, Nepal, United Kingdom, uh, Bangladesh, Brazil, Cote uh, d'Ivoire, <coughs> Italy, Japan, and uh, Hong Kong. Uh, this is the accepted article by the country or region, uh, the similar data. Uh, so for online submission, we uh, use the editor manager.com. Uh, <clears throat> so it's a very popular uh, website for most of the uh, scientific journals. And our homepage is uh, cnjournal.biomedcentral.com. So uh, all the published article uh, can be uh, downloaded uh, with the, <clears throat> the full text. It's an open access uh, journal. And uh, currently we weave the 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 APC, uh, so the, the authors do, do not need to pay uh, any uh, money for the for their published articles. So uh, yeah, that is just a brief uh, introduction and we uh, encourage more um, <clears throat> neurosurgeon all around the world to uh, submit your articles uh, to this journal. Thank you. Thank you, oh, uh, Professor Yuan Li. Professor so, Xi, yeah. Uh, so uh, we discussed with uh, uh, <clears throat> Professor Zhao Qizong and uh, Yuan Li, and uh, we were uh, invited the uh, authors of the articles to introduce their work in this uh, neurosurgical TV platform. So now uh, 
Today we have uh, a lost uh, a lot a lot of distinguished guests, like uh, Professor Atoko, Benitz, uh, Professor Lanzino from uh, Mayo Clinic, and uh, today we also have two uh, deputy uh, uh, chief editor, uh, Professor Pan Weisheng and uh, Professor Yuhan Hanisnemi. So now we profess, uh, invited the Professor Pan Weisheng to uh, have some uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh, let me uh, share the screen. Perfect, perfect. Uh, can you see the screen and uh, hear me talking? Yes. Okay, thank you. So, so I will start by thanking uh, Professor Zhao and Professor Zhao Jr. to invite me and also Professor Xu to allow me to uh, share with you my uh, uh, some of my views on uh, being uh, reviewing papers uh, for the last uh, 20 plus years. And sometimes it's uh, rather uncertain uh, because I may not know the stuff that well. And, uh, and sometimes it's, a, it, it's been a, a pleasure uh, to see uh, good papers. So uh, it's really a personal uh, sharing and uh, nothing very uh, scientific. So uh, I'm not working in Shenzhen. So this is the hospital in the bottom here uh, where I'm working now. I used to be working in Hong Kong for 35 years, uh, having qualified from uh, Glasgow uh, in uh, 1986. Um, now, um, to jump into the content of this uh, 20 minutes uh, sharing, um, to be a scientific a peer review uh, person, um, the essential job is really to evaluate uh, each manuscript that comes through, uh, its competence in presenting, uh, the significance of the research project, and its originality. And um, this kind of uh, peer review for science um, originated in those uh, private club in, in England, uh, like the Royal Society. Uh, John Hunter was a little uh, junior faculty at the time, and uh, he had to be uh, uh, peer reviewed before he can present it to the big boys. Um, so basically today, uh, editor in chief or its uh, section uh, chief will be selecting appropriate reviewers for each manuscript that comes through. And um, the reviewer, if they have accepted the request uh, out of his belief that his own ex expertise will do the job well and that he will, he's prepared to do it ethically uh, without bias. And the timeliness is also important. It's usually being requested to be done within two to three weeks. And looking back, the first reported peer review in medicine uh, actually happened in the Royal Society in Edinburgh in 1731. And that's been described by uh, Sir Jeffrey Jefferson uh, when he was uh, around. Uh, so so that's, that's been a long time, uh, this uh, business of peer review, which is so important to uh, every journal, especially the upcoming journals, like our uh, uh, Chinese Journal of Neurosurgery. Now, so to describe the established practice, um, when I was a medical student in 1976 uh, in Glasgow, um, Lancet 
was not peer reviewed regularly. So I still remember in those days when I was helping the Australian fellows who was, was working in Glasgow to get promoted. I was uh, participating in the project and helping them to uh, type write. You know, in those days we used typewriters, and of course um, the um, word processor wasn't around in those days. So, so we type one uh, sheet of paper. Any mistake, we will have to retype it altogether. So it's, it's quite a tedious thing. And uh, so in, 19, in the 1970s, it, it, it was just, a, I remember the paper was accepted um, um, and it was only a few words and it took only two or three weeks. So in those days, without peer review, the internal uh, editorial board did it very efficiently. And uh, so that was how I witnessed it uh, starting uh, as a medical student. Um, JAMA, the uh, premium uh, GP journal in the US, uh, has been around those days also as you wish things. So, so it's dependent on, um, on the uh, internal editorial board. Uh, in contrast, the BMJ uh, started the peer review in 1893 uh, from external experts outside the editorial board. So, so you can see the history that peer review wasn't really an established practice as it is today. And it becomes an established practice only in the last maybe 40, 50 years. And it's now becoming the norm. Um, way back in more than 10 years ago, when 4,000 authors were reviewed or questionnaired, uh, majority think that um, uh, thought that, or eighty-four percent thought that it is, it was essential to have it because that will improve their uh, papers' quality. Where uh, ninety-one percent of the authors think that that was the case, that every uh, peer review process actually improved the quality of their final product, and um, but only. 69% uh, were satisfied with what was happening, some with argument, some without, some majority are still happy, but uh, minority not so happy. Now, my, my personal route, I've described part of that uh, in the 1970s as a student uh, through the Lancet and through JNNP, uh, surgical neurology, neurology, and general neurosurgery and injury, etc. In the 1980s, um, in those days, when as a young faculty, um, when the paper was submitted, and um, as a young faculty, we waiting for the for the for the reply from from the editor in chief. I still remember um, uh, Ed Law was the uh, uh, editor in chief of neurosurgery, and uh, he wrote me back to to say that oh, this paper was not accepted, cannot be accepted in its own form, and has to do this, this one, two, three, four, five, and uh, so I, at that time, as an inexperienced uh, and anxious uh, young neurosurgeons, I was very upset. But in fact, that is. An encouraging letter because it says that, uh, um, well, it means that the editorial board is um, um, interested in the material, and there were a lot of things that you have to rewrite, and 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 that's actually the prerequisite of uh, accepting the paper. So of course nowadays most young Young authors know that if you receive that letter without saying rejection, that's you're okay, and there's a, there's a lot of hope to improve it. And I started uh, the occasional reviewing in the 1990s, and uh, and also at the, at the turn of the uh, century, uh, have uh, been privileged to join some of the uh, uh, prestigious editorial board. Um, 
And so when there are too many papers to review, uh, we have to learn to obey these rules that I will only accept reviewing paper within my comfort zone of my expertise. Anything outside, I would uh, decline, or if I do not have time at the, at the time uh, because of writing grants or 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 doing my own things, then I will decline uh, early, uh, sending my uh, apology. Um, and most papers, when if they were interesting paper, um, can be reviewed within actually within a few days if if you can uh, uh, set the time for it. So so I I'm still doing some of this work and enjoying uh, every minute. Um, I just want to take an example of. Uh, um, um, a paper that, that, that was reviewed last year uh, on a very important issue of uh, changing practice. In there's a big series is, a, is an RCT wanting to prove that a medical treatment is actually better than surgery. So that, that's an important uh, uh, study that will change practice. And, uh, but you can see that uh, the big boy journal um, if you, uh, the review is very simple, you only look at whether the originality is good, whether the scientific accuracy is good, whether the composition is good, and whether the material of the study of the manuscript will interest the uh, mass of the readers. So if you're scoring four or five, then the chances are that the editor-in-chief will be very difficult to reject this paper. And uh, with minor or major revision, you, um, and this paper should be, should be published from our, from our eye, provided my other reviewer agree. So only two reviewers, and um, sometimes, uh, an in-house statistical reviewer, and that that will be forming the the uh, the decision-making platform for the editor in chief, and um, so so that that's just to um, share with you um, how um, uh, you can use uh, your time very efficiently to review uh, some of these uh, very important uh, paper. Um, so, um, in the older days, um, like James Parkinson in 1817, he doesn't need to go through any uh, review process because he's got the resources to write his own book. So, so this essay on shaking palsy is, is published as a little monograph, although he has already presented it in, in the learned uh, societies. So that's just uh, in contrast. Now, um, um, the reviewers putting in a lot of their time uh, voluntarily, and how do they get recognized? So that 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 is a that that is a very important uh, point, and some of the journal will mention their name. Uh, at the beginning of the year or at the end of the year in one of their issues, one or two pages, a list of uh, reviewers that they have uh, thanked. And some journal will um, allow allow them or, or to send them copies of the hard, hard copies of the journals and or online access to the journal. And some will send them a letter of uh, appreciation. And some will be more uh, IT, like the Poblons, and uh, like the Union Journal of Medicine, they will uh, allow you or put uh, the work into their uh, recognized CME activities. Um, our journal, the Chinese Neurosurgical Journal, is very good at putting the list of reviewers that they uh, have thanked 
in the in the uh, web page and i think that's 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 very good um a recent paper I, I uh, we published with my uh, PhD student uh, in Frontier um, actually have the reviewer's name on the first page. And I think that's uh, probably a very good thing that uh, some of the journal can uh, consider uh, doing uh, because that would put the uh, reviewers uh, um, on the hot seat that they really have to uh, review the paper very seriously because their name is on it and they are part of this uh, research project. And uh, the experience is, is, is very good, uh, except that it's not easy to make an IT platform that is friendly to have a reviewers forum that the uh, reviewer and the authors can communicate. And that is an ideal thing, but uh, the platform has to be better than what it is now. And that, that's what I find. Okay, finally, uh, a few concluding remarks would be the majority of us are both authors and reviewers sometimes. So how to be a good reviewer, um, the, to have a good quality review, and the timeliness to do it quickly within two weeks. Uh, it, uh, both of these two elements are important to the, to the, to the authors, to the editor-in-chief of the journal, and also the profession at large. And um, we should accept with pleasure, and if time and expertise are both available, and uh, without the conflict of interest, but if, if time and and the uh, expertise is not there, then we should, we should decline. And uh, so here I would uh, salute to all the reviewers uh, that uh, peer reviews, um, it is uh, indeed a, a noble job. And I, this I would like to share with you. And I would like to acknowledge uh, thanking the editorial board, Yuan Li and Xu Bin and academician Zhao and the editorial board uh, for tolerating some of our uh, um, reviewers and authors that needs disciplining. Um, thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor uh, Pang Weishen. And uh, we uh, thank you for your uh, introduced uh, journal and your uh, own experience. And we also hope to you can uh, pick the speakers from this journal, and uh, we also want to uh, from your ex own experience of the uh, neurosurgical work. So uh, now we let's uh, invite the professor Yuha Hunesnemi uh, give us a presentation. He is also the uh, deputy uh, chief. In, uh, Chief Editor of this journal. Okay, thank you very much. Hello, everybody. This is first time I'm speaking from Helsinki, usually with John Pennett. I have joined from Changzhou, from China, but now I have been some months in Helsinki, Finland to finish my book on my memories. And I have good help here. Dr. Retsai Behnam Yahromi, my PhD student is helping me to connect. So I speak about bilateral international learning in neurosurgery. Actually, I should speak about multilateral learning because I have learned so much from many and this is multilateral international learning. So from my background, I didn't come inside Helsinki Medical Faculty in 1966. So I went to study medical science in Zurich and this was the big thing in my life. So because it changed my life and then 
After finishing my medical studies in Zurich, 1973, I specialized in neurosurgery, became specialist in neurosurgery, 79, made PhD also on difficult severe head injuries, and then spent 17 years in Kuopio, Eastern Finland, and was chairman 18 years in Helsinki until 2015. After that, I have been uh, six years around, main part in China, in Chengzhou, and on Provincial People's Hospital. So this year, I have 50 years in neurosurgery, and I will speak about that. I note there are many old friends that are in the audience. I'm sorry, I have to show the slides you have seen many times already, but it is only one life. So you cannot show all the time new things. Now, this is first I show here. This is the world map that was on the operation room in the Helsinki wall. And during my time, 18 years, since 1997, there were more than 3,000 visitors around the world. At that time, it was some kind of mecca of neurosurgery. All the people came to learn from Helsinki school. So you see also that there are many people of course, mainly from Europe, but also far away countries, even from Australia, and many Chinese and Japanese came also to visit Helsinki, and I had more than 100 fellows there. And I have to say that I traveled a lot, close to 1,000 times in those years, so I have been in most uh, countries there. I was invited also to South Korea, uh, North Korea, but then the pandemic came and I couldn't come. And I, I, doubt, I doubt I will never go there. But this is the changing of the experience. So, so many came, but I may went also to most of those places here, also into India, many places. So why, why so? Many people came in this time to this old, small, lousy hospital. The big building is founded in 1932, and the smaller part, newer part, 1958. Nearly all the neurosurgical clinics I have visited uh, uh, look better, but people didn't come to take a look on the faci facilities or houses. They came to see good, effective teamwork. And we have to remember always that no one can do surgery alone. Also by writing it is the same thing. Usually a group, a team is writing those scientific articles, but we had excellent and effective team in Helsinki and the visitors came to learn and went home and made the same. So the idea I noted during my time that it is old meat that neurosurgery should be endless and tiresome. And me and my team, we noted that you can do everything simple, clean, preserving normal anatomy. Clean means, means fast, so you can do many neurosurgical operations a day in one room. And this was the principle. So I think most of the visitors were impressed by neuroanesthesia and then the quick change of the patients when one operation finished, then the second one was soon in the operation room with an effective team. So this was simple, fast, clean, while preserving normal anatomy. This was the, our motto, and this was followed in the most, in the most uh, operations, more than 16,000 operations I made in Kuopio and Helsinki. And where is Finland? 
Finland is the most northern corner of Europe. Down green in the middle of Europe is Switzerland. This is the there is Zurich, the place I made my medical studies, and Finland is has close border to Russia, 1,300 kilometers, and this is very important at this moment of the Ukrainian war. And between Finland and China, there is only one country. This is the Russia. Russia is huge. So let's go back to the beginning. This is 1966. The, here I am with, with my friend, Reyo Korpela, Remy Korpela, and me after failing in the, the uh, failing to come inside Helsinki Medical Faculty. We didn't lose our courage. You see that we are looking to the future, smiling and with blue eyes, like we say in Finland. We didn't know what is coming. So how to become a good neurosurgeon, international neurosurgeon, famous neurosurgeon. I tell my story here and give some hints for training. Look around when you are young, want to become a neurosurgeon, look around. You have to find heroes, you have to find mentors who support you, and you cannot do anything alone. You need friends in neurosurgery to become a good neurosurgeon. And I never saw a person who wanted to be a bad neurosurgeon. So I speak to become a neurosurgeon now. These were my heroes here in this picture in Chicago, 1988, famous picture in Zurich when studying medical science. I saw already Professor Yasakil there. And here, Professor Yasakil, my hero, and other hero, late Professor Charlie Drake, are together in, in Chicago making cadaver dissection. And what I learned from both, they told, work hard, learn anatomy. Learn anatomy. This is extremely important in neurosurgery. In Zurich, there was extremely good anatomical teaching when I was medical student. Professor Chayan Tundri, 1969, I remember he was shouting, medical study is a lifetime work, anatomy even more. And the last part of this sentence is extremely true because it takes more than a lifetime to learn good anatomy. So this was Professor Chayan Turnery in Zurich, 1968. And he was heavy teacher, demanding teacher, but I learned a lot. And he had written an anatomy book, Topographische Anatomy. This is the book I have here at home. I have read it's 55 years because you never learn enough anatomy. It looks like that. Topographical anatomy. This is German language by Chayan Tundri. So I have read anatomy, but I don't know the anatomy well. So, and when I studied medical science in Zurich, so I went to research. There was a brain research institute in Zurich. Can you hear me? Please tell me if you can hear me. Yes. 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 Okay, we good. can hear. Because there was an announcement. So, so this is from the brain research institute. The picture 1969. So I was learning to uh, brain anatomy of a uh, rat and cat and made stereotactic operations on these animals. Professor Ezra Kavana from Japan was there. His English was not so very good. So, but I learned my English from him. 
and from Miss Helen Prupahe was laboratory technician. So in Brain Research Institute in Zurich, there were 20 different nationalities doing research, speaking English mainly. And so my English learning was coming there. So this is old picture. And this is from the operation room in Brain Research Institute, 1969. I'm doing a, a brain operation on rat or cat, and Professor Vetsuro Kavana is watching. And what is important here, I learned to use the microscope, 1969. This picture is, this is Opmuvan. This was maybe from the three years in the Brain Research Institute, the most important thing that I learned, besides one paper that was published in, in Acta Anatomica. So I learned to use the microscope there, and then I made my, uh, finished my medical studies. And then besides that, from the Brain Institute, we went to Leningrad, nowadays it is St. St. Petersburg. This is 1969. Also there was Congress of Anatomy, World Congress of Anatomy. This picture is in front of the famous Pavlov Institute. The director is in the middle, besides Professor Konrad Ackert, Ezra Kavana, my girlfriend at that time, and me. After giving a lecture, six minutes lecture, and there were maybe 10 people to listen, but I was very proud of my lecture because three girls came to uh, ask uh, uh, autogram after my lecture. So I was very happy after my first lecture, international lecture. And this is what I saw then when I noted that I'm not able to do lifetime basic research. This lonely job I saw was working in the clinics. And then I was thinking I will use the knowledge of brain anatomy to become a neurosurgeon. This is Professor Hugo Kreienbühl. He's the teacher, chairman of Professor Kreienbühl. And he had, was very impressive lecturer. He was speaking loud and had nice jokes when he was speaking, but he was also very strong. There was very strong discipline, and under this strong discipline, Professor Yasakil developed his tremendous career. I learned also when I began neurosurgery, you will not be rich when I began in Helsinki. This was the first message I was told that you will not become rich when doing neurosurgery. I didn't care. I began to work in neurosurgery. This is my first day, June 3rd, in neurosurgery. Different hairstyle a little bit now, and I'm dictating. And you see that I'm smoking cigarette during dictation. That time it was possible to smoke in Finland, to smoke cigarettes, I know, in China, you can still smoke cigarettes in hospital, even if it's forbidden, you are smoking, but now it's impossible. You, you, will, be, you will be fired if you smoke now and nowadays in Finland. And when I came now to Helsinki, so uh, it is uh, certainly impossible to smoke anywhere here. So this was the beginning of my neurosurgical career. And how was it? Uh, in the beginning of 70s. It was it looked like that because this was microscope came 1975 to Helsinki. So in the beginning it was microsurgery with head headlamp. And this is this is the history of the Finnish neurosurgery. There are three professors in the same picture. Pro Professor Kunar of Pjörkesten is operating on. Assistant is my chairman left in this picture, Henry Troop, and following is the first professor of neurosurgery, Arne Snellman. The 
something very special in in done around the world and i had learned to use the microscope so when the seniors began to operate with the microscope i could help them to lead their hand uh, support their hand when they began to operate on aneurysms in 1975 and this was how it was i was working a lot as a watch on the wall of the hospital it had stopped to walk some year years ago and it was never running in 20 or 30 years but i didn't know how long i was but uh, i was working long days that time also when i was doing my residency the operations without microscope they were extremely long they went many times to the small small hours in the midnight and uh, only with micro neurosurgical experience the operations became shorter and i was telling you have to have heroes but then you have to have mentors and this is my mentor before the time i came i came 1973 this is dr phd seppo pakarinen late seppo pakarinen he was my senior in helsinki when i was trained and he was a good human being great man he was always smoking pipe and supporting me in every uh, field in the com when complications came showing the op first operations and also whatever i had problems in my life he was always supporting excuse and this me. is what you need a good mentor to become a good excuse, nurse excuse me you are your, your slides not moving but well, there you go there you go it's now yes i was fine. speaking i didn't move the slide oh okay okay you see the pipe there oh, my doc, dr drake was also always smoking pipe whatever was written on the wall so this was is my life once more helsinki neurosurgery residency 73 79 and then phd on severe head injuries and then i was searching my place when i became specialist why i was searching a place to operate on a lot of cases i was in sweden in Kuopio, Eastern Finland, in Helsinki, and finally I selected Kuopio, where I was 17 years. And then from Kuopio, I made several visits to Professor Yasaki, also fellowship to London, Ontario, and Miami to Professor Drake and Peerless. And in Kuopio, I could operate on a lot of cases and difficult cases even i was very young in your research and this is 1982 giant avm on the right temporal lobe i could do because i read my books well i read everything what yasarkil and sukita and some others were writing and i was operating well with microscope every operation with microscope of course that kind of lesion would be even nowadays extremely difficult to treat for any neurosurgeon in the world but i was successful and i made many cases but it took a lot of time so it sucked all the hours and training and and then in the ten, 10 years when i was operating on in helsinki uh, Kuopio, i noted i have to go somewhere else to learn and i went to zurich i and then later to london ontario and miami and many other places around the world london also and this was my first visit in 1982 as a young neurosurgeon three years as a specialist in neurosurgery i went to zurich to see professor yasaki to operate on and it was it changed my life it was like a miracle how he was doing he was like usain bolt that time uh, number one then nothing else and then some other 
other neurosurgeons. So it was like a miracle when he was operating difficult cases, touching everything under the microscope, this mobile microscope, and extremely heavy discipline in the operation room. You were not coughing, not making any noise because he was throwing you out. This was the mouth switch I learned to use, and this makes your operations very fast. 40% less time. And this was the group that time, young neurosurgeons from around the world, because we were not allowed to speak in the operation room, not make any noise. So we went afterwards to the restaurant, this is why the wind, and then we discussed the wonderful operations of Professor Yasakil. This was good possible to do. And one day this guy, this young Mexican surgeon, Jesus, told one day we will do better. And we were laughing and thought it is impossible, but all the young generations are getting better. This is how it happens in your surgery. Another picture here. These were my heroes also and teachers, Professor, late Professor Charlie Drake and Skip Peeles, who is still alive in Florida. And we sometimes write to each other. Skip Peeles asked me, can I help you when I went to London, Ontario? And they both helped me in many ways, because without them, I wouldn't be a professor in Helsinki and do my life, main life work there. So this is Miami, 92. This is Kipilis family. And uh, the son, one of the sons, Drew, he sailed alone around the world after this picture. And this was the book we made in Miami. I was working extremely hard. My children were saying that father is inside the computer because I was 16 to 18 hours inside, in front of the computer, counting the patients, counting the patients. This was the book on 1,767 patients came out 95, forward by Professor Yasakil. Of course, it is old book, but I learned a lot from Professor Drake and Pierre's because I operated every case of them, their cases in my own brain. And I learned a lot also from Professor Drake, I learned that you have to be a good medical doctor, excellent neurosurgeon, and one of the most difficult things is to be a good human being. And this is the weakest place out of these three. But he was a great man. I went very old to make fellowship. I was 45, so Professor Picard from England was writing about me. At the age of 45, this man seems to be happy to analyze surgeries of others. But I learned a lot. I didn't care of that kind of writings. 2002, I went with my fellow Keisuke from Japan to Padova, Italy, to operate on a Basla Junction, giant honors on a poor medical, uh, poor student from Croatia, 4.5 centimeter big honors. And this is see after two years, after this operation, we operated first two MCA honors as a training, and then same day also afternoon this Vertebra Basra Junction and also in one room. So we did very well and we went many times to operate on that. She's, she's, she has now, she wrote me that she has married and she's doing well. In high age, of course, now she's 40. 
So these were my first fellows, and this is my first connection to China. This is uh, Dr. Hu Shen, who, who came from Shenyang, China. Now he is Shenzhen, he's retiring as a professor and chairman in Shenzhen. I met him during the visit, one visit there. Then came Keisuke from Japan, and then came Aise from Turkey, and Emel Afsi was also visiting. So these, these were my first fellows, and this is during the life course in Helsinki. At the life course in Helsinki, this was something very special. It brought the people around the world to come to Helsinki, and I learned a lot from all the people, more than they were learning from me. So this is the multilateral learning. And this is my last big team, the Latino team, because they were most mainly speaking uh, Spanish. And 2015, I was going to retire. So before I retired, my fellows were doing the 1001 video book. So this was the last effort there. In the book, Vertebra Basila book of the Drake and Peerless, that there is a nice quote from famous Francis Bacon, written many one hundred years ago. Every man owes it as a debt to his profession to put on record whatever he has done that might be of use to others. Complicated saying, but this means that you have to write down your experience and publish in the modern words. So we did that. So this book was done more than 10 years ago, in 2000, end of, I don't remember exactly how many, which year, maybe 13 years ago, it was published Helsinki Micro Neurosurgery book with Dr. Lehetska and Aki Lakso. We described everything, how we are doing the neurosurgery in Helsinki, and it has been translated in many languages in Chinese by Mao Ying, Professor Mao Ying, and his team. Subin has been also involved in translating it. It's translated in many, many languages. And uh, this is a practical book, how to do neurosurgery, let's say Helsinki type neurosurgery. So this is how was we were begin to fly high in Helsinki. This is two, June 2001. Professor Yasakil came to Helsinki. This photo is in June 2001. This left is my chairman, neuroclinic head, neurologist, Professor Marco Kaste, Professor Yasakil, Sukro Sakra, young Turkish neurosurgeon, and me discussing before Professor Yasakil's lecture. And this is 2003, Professor Yasaki teaching in Helsinki. You had to listen, you had to listen when he was speaking. You see that we are listening, we are listening. And here, this is 2003, Professor Yasaki at the age of 77, is still, still making gymnastics to win a difficult brain tumor. But the Finnish first female neurosurgeon, Lena Kivipelto, assisting professor there in his operation. And this is the picture. Hussein was a great artist. He had very, very talented in drawing. So he made the picture of uh, Professor Yasaki operating on in Helsinki. The picture is here. It, for me, it looks so that every person in the operation room is Chinese. There's no Chinese person, but the person who is drawing is Chinese. This means that we see the world with different eyes, according to our background. And this is Hu Shen closing. Why this picture is important? Because we closed under microscope. And this one I couldn't teach in China. No one was wanted to 
close under microscope, except my friend Hugo, Hugo Andrade. Palacharte was closing under microscope, but the Chinese didn't accept that. Not so many things from my teaching. So, but in Helsinki, there was a life course all the time, as I mentioned, more than 3,000 visitors and icons like Yasakil, Konovalov, Dolenz, Almefti, Spetzler came, and endovascular came also, Guglielmi and Moret came to visit and treat patients. So this was how it looked in the operation room all the time, 10 or more people following learning. And this is the, my successor, Professor Mika Niemela, with the smallest nurse in Helsinki. Now, the number of operations has increased everywhere in the world. I told that I have been 50 years in neurosurgery. The year I came to neurosurgery in Helsinki, there were 750 operations. And I became chairman, 1700. And then when I left, there were 3,500 operations. Why is that? Imaging came, CT came, and then MRI, and then, of course, microsurgery is doing possible more difficult operations, uh, more neurological resources, treatment methods, and lifetime is nowadays by far more higher than in 70s for some reasons. So number of operations in increasing, I have seen that, of course, also by many visits in China, and during my work, working at Henan, Henan Provincial People's Hospital. After the operation is the best time to teach. I'm Yasaki school, I learned not to speak during the operation, but, and I don't like questions during operations, telephone calls, this is in China is extremely much different. In China you are, shouting and making a lot of noise during the operation, but Yasakil school, no, no speaking. But after operation, this is the best moment to teach because you are full of adrenaline. Then you make your questions. So how to think about the situation now? There's heavy control of the surrounding society. We can see each others around the world, so nowadays you cannot continue with the flow of complications and poor surgery. Complications are no fates. They are mainly caused by lack of skills and or knowledge. And you have to be careful with that because you have only one chance. Quite frankly, I have to say now, if open microsurgery wants to survive, you have to be good and efficient. You have to be both. So, how to learn neurosurgery, learning anatomy, seeing operations and videos. You can see a lot of videos, surgical videos, but you have to be critical and you have to see them. If you only alter books or videos, then you are not learning anatomy or surgery. You should assist a lot in operations discussing, as I say, after operations, and then you begin to do your own operations, and you should spend a lot of time with neurosurgery. And if you have the possibility to go to cadaveric laboratory, this picture is done by Professor Emil Afsi uh, in, in the clinic of uh, Paskaya Mustafa, Mustafa Paskai, but you can find cadaver lab, good cadaver lab. If you don't have, you should have and build a cadaver lab, but it depends on the culture a lot. So, and then when you operate, you should have a good mobile microscope. Now I know, of course, many young people are saying that exoscope is coming, it's okay. It doesn't change, change the thing that you have to learn anatomy and you have to 
you have to treat the lesion. This was what I was using. So mouth, micro, mobile microscope with mouthpiece, that's good audiovisual system so the people in the operation room are seeing everything you can save all the operations like we did made, making photos and then editing and also publishing and what i have learned in china you are using substicks when you are eating so you learn to use long instruments but what i have learned short instruments they make everything better proper instruments. You don't have to have long instruments when you are superficial operating. So your surgery is better with the short instruments. Manual skills are important. Important is planning, doing clean surgery, clean surgery, effective surgery, many operations you can do a day, and focus microsurgery. Treat, just treat the lesion and only the lesion. There's a lot of discussion that it is dangerous to open the head. And this is one of the things I always heard in China, because in China, Chinese are afraid of the head to be opened. This was not so in Helsinki. I never heard from any patient or surrounding. But in China, it's very common. I, why it is common? Because endovascular is heavy and it is used against the open microsurgery nowadays, this sentence. So this is the simple lateral supraorbital approach I was using since 80s. And what is important? Flap, flap should be large enough for your skills, for your instruments, and for the lesions, because surgery is not sports. You should not try to go through too small uh, openings. This is dangerous for the patients. And extremely high respect to Helsinki anesthesia. The most important thing in Helsinki was what the visitors were saying. How is the brain slack? And when the brain is slack, then you can do beautiful surgery. So they have their tricks and anesthesia is very important. Head high when you operate, head high about the cardiac level. This means reduced bleeding. Usually I had no blood reserved because of a good anesthesia and this head high policy. And I was moving all the time, the microscope with mouth switch, because if you look with the microscope all the time in the same spot, then the microscope is burning the prey. So I was always using high percentage light, but all the time moving with the mouth switch, the microscope. And since 80s, using a lot of tissue glue to stop bleedings in skull base, tumor bed, Hot drilling to stop bony bleedings with diamond drill and high magnification, highest magnification possible for the microscope since 2007. It is difficult to do. And I had to learn specially to do that, the highest level of the microscope. But, uh, I did that. And this, where is this picture? This is not from Helsinki. This is from Chengzhou, an unprovincial people's hospital. You see, I was provided the same set, instrumental set, than in Helsinki before I came to an unprovincial people's hospital, microscope, the, the scrap nurse is Ping Chen. She's looking at the screen and she's skillful. We are not speaking. We are just doing surgery. Good team also we could develop, but it takes time. It takes one year time to have a good team. So you cannot go everywhere just to operate on. So I thank all the personnel in the 50 years. I had all, always good teams. And I was not, I was maybe one of the most important persons in the team, but you cannot operate alone. So you have to have five, six persons around you to make good surgery. 
So there are many routes that go to Rome. So what do I say? Go around, take a look. It, your surgery is like cooking food. You will see many different ways to operate on. In China, the food is totally different than in Europe, but we are eating it and we are alive. So you should select your way to do the neurosurgery and you should take the best one pieces of neurosurgery, what you can see around. There are many ways to do the same thing and select and make your own neurosurgery. This was uh, my thinking slowly developing Helsinki. And this is once more the visitors that came to Helsinki around the world. And I learned so much from them. This is multilateral learning. And uh, if, of course, there are different levels of manual skills. So here it is. The upper picture is Professor Spetzler, one of the editors in your Chinese journal, now visiting Helsinki 2009. I operated pericolosal aneurysm, and below is uh, Tanikawa. He's doing fiber surgery in the life course in Helsinki. So there are different levels of manual skills. And what disturbs me in China, and say it now quite frankly, you have excellent neurosurgeons in China, but you are not publishing. And you should publish your class series. This is extremely important because you have excellent neurosurgeons. This is one of my heroes, Konovalov in Moscow, I'm honorary professor at Burdenko. This is not important. Important is that I he was my hero with this extremely great surgical experience. This is World Neurosurgery. You can see also Professor Chao here down. And I'm here. What, is, what are these people? This is 69 best neurosurgeons in the last 100 years. So this is good company. I'm in good company with Professor Cushing, Yasakil, Drake, Sami, etc. Atul Goel. So good microsurgery. I'm speaking a lot, but uh, I could speak by far longer. I try to reduce below one hour. Only training makes a master. Then you should eliminate the tremor and you should analyze your own experience. You should learn English. You should publish. Chinese neurosurgeons learn English because you have beautiful series, big series. You should teach the world and please, when the pandemic is over, take a look and travel. I have learned so much traveling around the world. Neurosurgery is not different from soccer, sports, playing violin, learning a new language or writing. Hard training is needed, and this is important. So this is old rule, 10,000 hours. You 10,000 hours training, you will come to world top. And this is my rule. With 10,000 days in operation room, you will be at the best of your career. This is very important. So if you are done 100 times an operation, then you are not experienced. You have to do it 1,000 times. And this means repetitions are the clue in neurosurgery. You should look around east and west, north and south. You should look around the world now, Japan, China, Korea, India, Russia, etc. Everywhere now in the world is extremely good neurosurgery done. And you should go around, ask for good places. There are many and discuss where good neurosurgery is done and go there to learn. Not the walls, but the team is doing the work. It is not important to have that kind of fine hospital. It is important to be effective and good in the operation room. You should train your best young people. 
they should become better than you. This is the principle. Of course, the younger generation is getting better because they are standing on our shoulders. Problems in training, three problems. Time, time, time. To become a good neurosurgeon, you have to spend a lot of time in neurosurgery, regular working time regulations in Europe are not good to make high level neurosurgeons. 37 hours a week of working time means that you have to do a lot of off job training, treat anatomy, train manual skills, look videos, recordings. If you can draw, this is a drawing of Hu Shen, 2000, year 2000 from aneurysm operation. Beautiful drawing. We use these drawings in our publications, and I have seen many neurosurgeons in China are very good in drawings. The drawings are like honey. They make the, the paper to be accepted. And if you cannot draw, then make records, make old photos. You can analyze them and learn anatomy. So you have to learn planning of the operations and mental training. You have to make the operations in your mind and how to optimize training. I'm coming soon to the end. I may see that you are getting nervous. Discuss your problems when you are, are trained in your surgery. You should share your troubles with somebody you trust. And this is the mentor. You should work hard, do also unpleasant jobs well, assist a lot, then you see a lot and uh, smell the blood. I say, you will learn the neurosurgery, learn from others, learn also from nurses and cooperate well, because you have to know that no one can be a neurosurgeon, a trained neurosurgeon alone. So, Finally, life is easier now than 50 years ago. There's very many ways sharing the after experience. I was speaking a lot of traveling. Nowadays, you don't have to travel. Of course, the pandemic made us to learn different ways. John Bennett helped us to make webinars and we can get the experience from the best neurosurgeons around the world, through webinars, in internet is full of knowledge, but you have to be critical. There's full of knowledge, but there's not a lot of wisdom in the internet. So you have to be critical with internet and also with the internet surgery. I heard the, about the, the many neurosurgeons in internet and they are giving advice how to operate on this is not very wise because you don't know many times who is giving uh, your advice and how are the conditions in the operations room. So internet neurosurgery might be also dangerous. Audiovisual techniques are better, operative videos you can have and training is maybe better nowadays. Life surgery courses go down. The Helsinki, famous Helsinki life course has finished, is finished now. Who is continuing? Baro is continuing, Sapporo is continuing, uh, Istanbul is continuing, some famous places. So the Meccas are changing their places. And I thank you very much. Sorry if I spoke too much to Flat Venice, you noted I didn't show the last Mohican slide. So, but I say, Kitos, thanks, say, say, ni. Thank you, Professor Honis Nemi. Thank you for your amazing presentation <clears throat> and your very good suggestions for the Chinese neurosurgeon. And uh, that's also our purpose uh, for uh, Dr. Yuan Li and uh, me, and uh, we also want to promote this Chinese medical, uh, Chinese neurosurgical journal and uh, 
made uh, our Chinese neurosurgeons work, uh, <clears throat> introduce their work to the world. Thank you again. Thank so you very much. Yeah. Uh, I have to say that uh, Dr. Supin came many times to Helsinki life course. So he was first my student, then he was my neurosurgical colleague, and now he's my hero because he is one of the most <laughs> oh, effective hero. team leaders in the world. He has done more than 10,000 biopsies, so he's uh, certainly the leading biopsy surgeon in the world. So this is how to do, to begin. And one of the important things is to have connections around the world and learn English and publish. And uh, now when the pandemic is over, so certain the people are coming to Washington Hospital to learn from you and others in Washington Hope's Hospital. Ying Mao is the chairman there. And also I have been in the Theater Hospital. Didn't visit the new buildings, but when I'm allowed to come to China, the pandemic is heavy now also in China and also now the war in Ukraine is preventing uh, flying easily to China. So let's, I hope I can visit China. We will see each other. But uh, thank you very much for everything, uh, for supporting my time in China and uh, we remain in good connection. I hope my memories can be translated in Chinese. They will come in September 1st out, then we, there is a translation in English, and then you can translate in Chinese. So this is the plan. Yeah, that's for sure. 500 pages. Thank you. 500 pages in Finnish, but uh, in Chinese, maybe for 350, because Chinese writing is so yes. short. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So now you only time. Hi. Time to go to you. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Yoha. I uh, wish you can come back to China as early as possible. <laughs> thank uh, you very much. Thank you. Last yes. speaker uh, tonight will be uh, the lady, Miss Li. Uh, she's the publishing director okay. of uh, Springer Nature Publisher, and uh, she will give us uh, a talk about how to uh, publish with uh, Springer Nature. The one of the best uh, publisher in the world. Thank you. Thank you for your introduction, Dr. Zhao. So I just uh, share my screen first. Is it working? Yes. Ah. Okay. So um, you want to put on presentation very... mode? Uh, oh, yes. Uh, yeah, it's not on presentation mode yet. There yeah. you go. Perfect. Um, Okay, so my name is Joyce Lee. I'm uh, the publishing director for Spring and Nature in the Greater China region. And um, I have been working with Yuan Li and other people on Chinese uh, Neurosurgical Journal for uh, from the very beginning. So that's how I am personally connected to the neurosurgery uh, community, which I feel um, it's always a pleasure um, to serve with a different communities uh, we work as publishers. So, so today I'm just going to give you a very, very brief overview of who we are at Spring and Nature. I'm sure some of you are our authors and our reviewers and our um, editors as well. Um, not just for our journals, but also um, with our books publishing as well. So um, I also want to thank you for, for all your support. Um, without further ado, so I just want to, um, uh, so in our business, Spring and Nature as a publisher to be known by maybe uh, many of you in the audience today, uh, we are a publisher for journals, but we also publish books. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that's the, the research business is the biggest part. <clears throat> Sorry. Is the biggest part in our uh, business, but we also have the education department, which focus on language learning. And we also have some in international curriculum. I understand our audience is very international. So our 
education part is very strong in, for example, Mexico and in some other area. We also have our professional business, which is concentrated uh, in Europe. So um, as you have now um, sum up our <clears throat> journal brands, um, we are very proud with, with many of the brands, um, especially in, in journal community we publish, such as Nature, but we also are very proud to have a BMC, which is a pioneer uh, in open access publisher, uh, publishing um, now maybe 20, 25 years ago. And uh, we also have Springer, which have a 175 years of history um, covering many, many disciplines. Uh, there are uh, different kind of um, areas we are trying to, to focus, but that's, that's what makes us very uh, proud as a publisher because um, that's how we connect with our communities. And as you can see, we are very, very international and I'm very much in agreement with what uh, Yuha has mentioned about the importance of connecting um, in today's world, especially. And I think as publisher or in, in the publishing industry, we carry this commitment um, to make sure a science uh, research is always connected. And that's how we uh, place our staff to be closer to the community. Um, as I mentioned, like, like uh, for Springer Nature, one thing has always remained true, which is to help researchers advance the disco uh, discovery and um, making their findings accessible to support them and make sure we understand their needs, you know, um, and, and just to, to bridge a lot of communication in the, in the scientific community, but also in the uh, clinical community. Um, and some of the uh, quick facts about um, Springer Nature as a company. So we have over 10,000 uh, staff and uh, for just for the research business. And you can see we have a network of um, many editors and reviewers and authors. Um, and we receive lots of submissions over a year. Um, like in 2020, uh, we published um, um, 370 meaning articles in a year, but uh, also you can see a lot of them are open access. Um, so that's, that's some very basic facts, but at the same time, uh, for maybe for our audience, especially in the Europe, um, you will be more aware of our activities in the transitioning to open access process, uh, such as the project deal we signed with Germany as the largest transformative deal to, to, to respond to the funder requirements and to support the transparency and easier communication of research results. So, so, so we are very much leading uh, in that uh, field to support the development of um, uh, scientific communication. Um, and when we speaking about open science, it's not just about open access, but it's also about data, you know, how we um, make sure our data is reusable and in the medicine and life science, um, community re reproducibility is very, very important. And in clinical community, uh, how can we make sure we follow the standard reporting process is also very important. So uh, with some uh, study, um, we discovered for open access publishing, it brings uh, more like visibility to the articles uh, authors publish. For example, we have seen uh, six times more downloads and 1.6 times more of citations from the articles published by uh, Springer Nature. And you can see in, in eight European countries, 70% of the content published with those uh, um, with authors from those countries are already open access. 
uh, for for spring and nature. Um, and also uh, with with the community, um, there's another um, big uh, theme in Spring Nature's commitment, which is to support the United Nations uh, sustainable development goals. So in our uh, publishing program, we also try to attach the significance of the journals we publish to, to some of the societal um, challenges or or at least with the scientific community, we are making a joint efforts trying to support the research around those um, important topics. And we also trying to advance our technology to support the discoveries. Um, but of course, as a company, we also operate as a responsible business by, and we also release annual report on our activities around that. Um, so like uh, the next part, I would just want to uh, briefly mention to you about the, the, the um, our journal program in not just in neurosurgery, actually, like it also covers uh, neurology and some parts of the neuroscience. So you can see uh, we, I, I just list a few um, points uh, here. And you can see we have a strong portfolio of over 150 journals in neurosurgery, neurology, and neuroscience for our authors to choose based on their uh, specific expertise discipline, but also in terms of the, the, the um, scope and threshold of different journals, uh, we are just trying to make sure there's always a home for your uh, clinical research or um, case reports. Um, and uh, we have 81 journals with impact factor um, in the category of uh, clinical neurology and uh, neuroscience. One third of those journals ranks uh, ranking Q1 in uh, journal citation reports. Um, but of course, we also have a lot of new launch journals which still haven't received impact factors such as Chinese neurosurgery, uh, neurosurgical journal, but uh, we do see a lot of potential and we definitely call, your, uh, call for your support to those uh, journals which um, is designed to support um, your clinical communication. And of course, we also have a lot of broad scope medical journals, but uh, some of them are more focusing on um, basic research such as nature medicine. Um, but, but we also have uh, like, like some, like for example, nature communications, like it covers a very, very broad scope. Uh, in in our scientific topics, so so this is just to give you a flavor of um, what we publish, um, and and in terms of you know like how we see us as publisher, the roles we play, uh, we feel it's very important to make sure that the, the content, the great content you submit to us, we publish, they are being seen to, to the wider uh, audience. So uh, the, the, the displaying and highlighting of the content on our, on our platform is always very, very um, important to us. So, so I just uh, showcase a few uh, things uh, we've done for different journals. We do cover papers and we also put on uh, uh, special collections on the journal website also to facilitate be better um, access to, to um, audience which are in, uh, who are in, interested in a specific topic. Um, and you can see we also, in terms of our um, supporting our authors, like with our subscription content, we um, have shared it, which means you can actually uh, share your work to your colleagues, um, for, to people who don't have necessary subscription to uh, Spring and Nature content, but they can use this just to share. Uh, the content so people can read, but of course um, they can't download the, the PDF. Um, but for our open access um, 
content, you can always access them uh, no matter um, where you are. Um, but we also have ORCID and uh, Research Square, which is providing a, a, a preprint <coughs> server because um, I remember uh, Dr. Pan just uh, mentioned about, you know, um, the importance of transparency <clears throat> in peer review. So we also have a lot of journals with we, um, the more like with very transparent, uh, <clears throat> transparent uh, peer review model. And uh, especially um, in the uh, medicine um, uh, communities. And I think people uh, more or less welcome that transparent approach. But we also have Research Square provide a very um, sort of transparent author dashboard so people can have better sense of when they submit the article. They have better sense of where it is. So, so the, the, the submissions do not end up with a black box. Um, so you will know, oh, my article is sent out for review or, or um, my editor is still looking for reviewers and he tried several times, but still um, uh, more reviewers are, are still being looked for. Those kind of information to keep authors um, having more ownership of of the submissions, but also to facilitate the transparency in, in the, in the uh, publishing process. Um, and also, as I mentioned, uh, make, making sure the content we publish have the widest visibility is very, very important. So we, um, for our marketing team, uh, we actually do a lot of work to, uh, for example, we do a lot of search engine optimization to make sure um, people can find your article easier by keyword search. But we also have um, journal article alerts. So if you go to one of the Spring Nature Journal website, you can very easily sign up to journal uh, alerts. So for example, I also uh, encourage you to sign up uh, the journal alert for um, the Chinese Neurosurgical Journal. Uh, so you, you have, you will receive those newsletters where we have um, articles published from time to time. But of course we, uh, with, especially with the younger generation, uh, a lot of um, discussions uh, uh, around scientific topics that happen on open uh, on social media. So we have, uh, sorry, we have um, um, different social media accounts trying to facilitate those discussions. Um, and and we also because uh, benefiting from our very wide um, staff network, we also have, for example, in China we have uh, a team working on on Chinese social media. Um, but of course, we also do a lot of um, traditional email campaign. But we understand that has been working less. But you can tell me like how you uh, wish to be informed of, you know, something happening around journals, you know, those are the like su suggestions we are always welcoming to hear um, to improve our service um, to you as our um, most important um, audience. And you can see for our journal content, uh, we have a very diverse um, audience um, spread out and more in America, but also in Europe, Asia, but Asia Pacific and Africa also have um, um, a good amount of um, uh, readers and visitors um, to our website. And um, so you can see um, we don't just publish more articles, but we can also also see a trend in uh, the number of downloads or the usage from the articles we publish. And that's quite obvious, especially for, uh, I, I think 2020 is a special year uh, because of the pandemic 
related research. And I think that's tr uh, true for many publishers. We have seen a, a very uh, spike um, in terms of submissions, but also um, usage to, to our journal content, uh, especially. Um, but in general, there is a very uh, steady uh, growing trend in terms of how your content published with Spring Nature journals are being consumed and used by your communities. And uh, the last, uh, maybe that's not the last one, sorry. So we also offer the so-called transfer service and to put it simple, so when an author submit to the journal, you feel um, would like to submit but maybe editors feel oh it's out of scope or you know like maybe there's another journal fits you better so we have a dedicated team to offer those kind of service to try to find another home for your research with better um, targeted uh, and data-driven uh, suggestions for you to like uh, to avoid the hassles of you know going around um, trying to find another journal to submit. So 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 that has been working quite well. In Postman Nature, we are also developing a new. Uh, editorial system, like once we are able to put all of our journals on that uh, submission system, I think we will be able to provide a more efficient uh, and um, easy service to all of our authors. And last but not least, so like I still want to go back to our journal, the Chinese Neurosurgical Journal by, you know, I know <clears throat> Dr. Zha has just introduced how we develop and I just want to show you some milestone we have. It's not easy for clinical journals <laughs> and I know like maybe many of the people here are also very experienced editors and um, um, I feel I personally have learned a lot by working on this journal and there are a lot of uh, proud moments we celebrated for the journal and it, like like there's I think for a lot of us working on uh, publishing journals especially for uh, our acad academia um, editors and reviewers uh, it's probably more like uh, mission driven because I know everyone has a full-time job and very busy. So, so I think, but like a publishing a successful journal to serve the needs of the community is always very rewarding as I understand from many of my editors. And uh, so I just um, still want to encourage you to continue to support this journal to uh, read the articles we publish, but and I'm uh, sure we're very open to your suggestions for you know either new uh, new things we want to try out or you know um, better ways to serve um, the the neurosurgery um, community as a whole. But not just in China, but we definitely set our um, ambition and target on the international community, and that's just something. Uh, I want to share and I also want to take this opportunity to thank uh, all of our editorial board members here at the meeting today and thank you for your hard work and your your continuous uh, support. Thank you. And that's it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Joyce. Uh, okay, uh, I think that's uh, all for the, the speakers uh, tonight. And uh, are there any uh, comments? from our panel uh, guests. Uh, Professor Poon, actually, I have a, a question about the, your, your talking. Just as you said, even the journal, the Lancet, uh, just to start uh, the, the peer review uh, system in the recent uh, 30 years, right? So, do you think in the future, is there any any possible for the the change? I mean, maybe we, we don't need any any more uh, uh, review, and just uh, everyone can uh, publish uh, what uh, what they want to publish. 
uh, like uh, like uh, the now we have uh, <coughs> the <coughs> I don't know I I, I forgot how, how how to say it this the the research square has uh, oh, do you know that yeah the the pre uh, review publish system right I don't know if if it's it will be the next generation of uh, the publishing system. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, no, that that's a very good question. I mean, nowadays, you know, peer review has become uh, a little um, um, it becomes a label of uh, of a, a good. Uh, research project and a good paper. So the question is whether we should uh, speed it up. You know, some very efficient journal, they, their submission to uh, accept it for a, a publication uh, time is only four or five weeks. And uh, as we all know, some journals, some old fashioned journal, can take up to six months to a year for publication. And that really kill quite a lot of graduate students. They can't qualify, they can't find a job. So, so there must be a way to speed up the review process. And I think within a few weeks should be the maximum. I think the, uh, all, all the reviewers and the, you know, and the, and the, uh, um, and the chief editor sh should have that uh, in mind because an anything beyond a few months, the study will be outdated. So, so I think um, timely review and timely publication is the key. Now, if you've got unlimited resources to write a book, then you don't need uh, a review. You know. To, to get invited to write a book would be, would be uh, something um, that you can you can write what you want um, um, uh, without being reviewed. And I think the, the thing you talk about when you have a well-planned study and uh, you registered and you let the journal, the usually Lancet or, or New England Journal of Medicine, they pre-review your your sort of pilot study or your uh, registered uh, study, and and I think those are uh, meaning that the review process has started, you know, be well before you have the full data, and I think that's that that is that on itself it, it's a, it's a very serious review. So one can't say that 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 is a paper published without being reviewed. And I think peer review is still the uh, premium process to guarantee a good paper. And so far, I hope I, I, I answer your question. If, if I may say something as well, I very much agree uh, to uh, Professor Pan on this uh, topic because I think uh, with the, the growth of a lot more preprint uh, content, it's a good thing because in a like competitive field, like it's better maybe for people to see what's happening, then uh, we have more time for peer review because I still feel, especially for the medical content, uh, the publishers and editors are doing a lot more work um, in the like uh, ethics and reporting standards. You know, there are a lot more values we are putting into this process, no matter like uh, apart from the peer review uh, quality of the, the research itself. But I think we need to be very careful and there has been a lot of debate uh, you know, in the uh, academia, but also in the publishing industry about like um, the, like what's the future of uh, publishing? Like, is it preprint? But I think we have seen a lot of um, cases in the pandemic, like like with preprint that draws people concern in some, in some extent. So I still feel 
uh, the the value of peer review is there, but like I think there's a big question for both academia and publishers. It's like how can we improve it? Um, is it still the same way to do the peer review process? And for us as publishers, we definitely want to support, for example, we are uh, for Spring Nature, we are actually working with some AI company to make sure we can provide better service to our editors to find, uh, you know, like uh, more suitable reviewers in a short period of time, but also that to save a lot of labor from, you know, I know many of you receive many, many uh, invitations from different journals every day, perhaps. So, so I think it's uh, uh, like still a topic to discuss, but I still, I also very much hold a high value for, for the peer review, but I also, um, like uh, we're very open to the new format and we are also working with all the uh, print service um, to see like how to better serve the author's needs and also to the registered reports as Professor Pan mentioned, uh, rolling out by many of the top level journals. Um, BMC actually has tried it from many years ago and there's as Professor Pam mentioned, there's very, very um, specific peer review process when people submit their research plan. And the research will need to be rolled out as specifically uh, explained in the plan. So the point is uh, to address a question of whether can we publish negative results. So that's a good like that's how this model has been developed in the first place. So like once your research plan, the register re uh, report is accepted by a journal, no matter the data is, they will publish it. As long as you know the, the experiment is rolling out in the same way. So there are many new ways trying to, uh, you know, uh, explored by journals and publishers to uh, support uh, the the development of of research and um, yeah that's just something I want to um, add. Is Dr. Lanzino here? Dr. Lanzino, uh, thank you. Uh, so, are there any any comments? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm here. I'm here. Could you comment, Dr. Welcome, Dr. Lanzino from Mayo Clinic. Welcome. Thank you for coming. No, I, um, I, it has been a really comprehensive uh, uh, overview of all different um, aspects of publishing. I don't have any uh, specific comment, um, except that, uh, of course, it's uh, uh, very uh, exciting uh, what's going on with the Chinese Journal of Neurosurgery. As, uh, Professor Ernest Niemi said, uh, it's, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of uh, things that uh, we can uh, uh, learn from the Chinese colleagues because many of them uh, have uh, um, already unsurpassed uh, experiences. And uh, at the same time, uh, uh, to have uh, a, a journal uh, that encourages contributions uh, from um, um, other parts of the world as well. I, I think that it's a welcome uh, uh, addition. Uh, um, it's um, very important as it has been stressed to try as much as possible to speed up the uh, review process. And also the other thing as I would recommend is that uh, because there are um, already uh, so many submissions, as we have seen, uh, it's important also to be uh, selective so that uh, you can uh, maintain a very high quality. One uh, uh, issue that I've noticed uh, with uh, some uh, um, neurology, neuroscience journals is the, at times, the lack of consistency, you know, like uh, one author might get uh, a paper rejected uh, only to see a very similar uh, manuscript to be uh, published in the same journal. And uh, I think that it's important uh, 
especially at the highest levels of the editorial process, that there is uh, some degree of uh, active uh, oversight where uh, the um, uh, section editors or the, uh, uh, they really uh, take an active role in uh, overseeing the entire process and um, uh, to make sure that there is consistency because I think it's uh, something um, something very important. And uh, another thing I've noticed that sometimes uh, lacks and says, I bring it up as a suggestion for the same reason, it's very important uh, from uh, the um, uh, leadership of the editorial staff to really give uh, or suggest uh, some directions to the uh, reviewers in terms of uh, uh, which papers uh, should be, um, you know, it's not only a matter of quality. Sometimes, uh, you know, with journals, they get a variety of different, uh, uh, different papers. And it's important to uh, be uh, clear in terms of what should be um, uh, given priority? Is it only novelty? What about uh, a larger series from a well-known neurosurgeon that uh, might not have a lot of novelty, but um, might, be, um, uh, might be important, uh, um, even from a historical point of view, to, uh, to, see, um, uh, to see published? So, I think it's uh, great what's uh, going on. It's a natural evolution of the um, diffusion of uh, knowledge. Uh, and uh, I wish my uh, colleagues uh, well, uh, and uh, um, I'm sure that uh, we will hear more and more about their journal. Hey, Dr. Goel, are you uh, there, Dr. Goel? Do you want to comment? Yeah, yeah, of course. Do you want to comment? No, nothing more to add, but I can only convey my best wishes to the Chinese Neurosurgical Society. I know about China. I know I have many friends in China, and I know how much contributions they have been making and they have already made. You see, now gone are the days where English was a problem. Oh, I don't understand English. I don't know English. I cannot write English. Those days are, you know, they, there was a history. Now, what we have to do is to introduce ideas, introduce thoughts, introduce concepts, introduce philosophies, introduce techniques. And that is what I'm sure, you see, I have no doubt that this journal is going to grow this journal is going to progress and uh, this journal is going to become the leader of world neurosurgery. Only thing is we have to, as we have, as uh, Giuseppe has mentioned that we have to be consistent, we have to be regular, we have to be quick and we have to be at, you know, accommodating to people from all over the world. We have to be like neutral umpires and we have to, you know, just go ahead and this journal is already an established journal. And I see that there are many people in the, on the panel who are editors of various journals and senior people like Zhuha is here giving advices. So you have a big editorial board panel who can be, you know, can just give you some kind of information and some kind of, you know, guidance essentially you know, I am also in editor panel of World Neurosurgery. Now I see the articles from China are the maximum in the whole world. They have over seeded um, American articles. So I am uh, I know about my own journal, uh, Journal of Cranial Junction and Spine. The Chinese article are, you know, coming on a regular basis. So I have no doubt with the education system of China, with the neurosurgical system of China, with the inter neurosurgeon competition in China. And you know, every in, in one department, there are 150 neurosurgeons, everyone is competing with the other to produce more articles. Every department is competing with other department in China, I know China very well. And I can see a big bright future. And I hope I can be party to that growth of Chinese neurosurgery. 
and the China Journal, this Journal of Neurosurgery. My best wishes to all of you, and I hope and I wish that this, this companionship and this journal will grow to greater heights in the future. Thank you very much for inviting me on this beautiful occasion. Mike, Michael Segru, do you are you there, Michael? Yep, I'm here. Yeah, Michael, you want to comment? And, and could you please introduce yourself and welcome, Michael? Hi, everyone. Uh, Mike Segru. I'm sure some people know me. I'm in Sydney, Australia, from the United States originally. And I think a couple of things that I think are worth going to. So uh, to bring up the comment about preprint servers, I'm completely against them. I think they're terrible for science. And if you want the best examples of it, there were numerous papers that were published that made a big splash with the anti-vaccine. They did damage to, you know, arguments of people who could use this to convince people to not get vaccinated against COVID-19 that were never past peer review. So we have to, as an editorial board, stand strong and say, we need to make sure that our peer review process makes those kind of things unnecessary. Because really, if we believe peer review is important, and I think everyone here does, we need to hold ourselves to that. And to that end, I think I can give some advice on what I have found that's helpful editing journals to kind of defend that. And part of it is that a good editorial process screens a lot of things before they get in. You know, we're editors, we have a good idea about what are low quality work that can that shouldn't really, we shouldn't demoralize and, and drain the resources because reviewing a lot of low quality papers really undercuts people's belief in the journal, it cuts hurts the impact factor. And some of those things get through that shouldn't. And so it's really important that we as editors take a, a effort to really get rid of things that don't really shouldn't be, you know, we don't have a question that they shouldn't be published. And I think that when you do that and you manage a good process where you I really have tools to identify who are the people who actually respond to reviews and get them done quickly. That's really important from the publishers, but also running a, an orderly and efficient process. Well, we can't always guarantee this is gonna be two weeks. We can get this down to a month or a month and a half instead of six months. And so what I found that a lot of times there's very big differences and particularly the more modern journals have gotten more efficient at providing editors the tools to really get this done as quickly as possible. When we have peer review processes that are efficient, we don't need to go think, work around this process. And I think it's just better for everybody because um, things that aren't really gonna be competitive at the journal, they have an opportunity to go somewhere else or figure out what they need to do better. Um, we don't have our journals overloaded with you know, reporting esoteric tumor cases that really aren't going to necessarily move the field forward. And we keep our reviewers engaged so that they actually find something valuable out of editing it. I think if we do those kind of processes, we're really going to have a good, strong peer review process and a good, strong journal. Thank you, Michael. Back to you, Ben. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh... Dr. Hassan, are you there? Thank you, Professor Lenzino uh, and uh, Michael, and uh, thank you for your suggestions. And uh, uh, our plan is uh, we will uh, select uh, uh, some authors and present their works on this platform every two weeks uh, on the Sunday night. Yeah, we would love to televise that. Mm -hmm. OK, Yuan Li. Hi, yeah, thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you, everyone. So I think it's a, a good uh, a start. And uh, yeah, as uh, Dr. Shi said, we plan to have this uh, meeting Start from today. There will be uh, every uh, two week. We uh, we want to host a uh, like a special uh, journal uh, meeting. It's a kind of a special channel uh, channel on neurosurgical TV. And every time we will invite two or three uh, speakers uh, to introduce uh, what they uh, published 
on the journal and also uh, some experience about uh, publishing of some small <coughs> <clears throat> and uh, also, uh, we want to invite some uh, uh, editors to introduce. Yes, the lines of communication are open. Uh, we'll listen to ideas from Ben and, and from Wan Li and whoever. Uh, is there anything else, Ben? Uh, do you want to go over? Or? Yeah, so uh, thank you everybody and uh, now uh, tonight is uh, quite late and uh, uh, mm -hmm. after we organize the next uh, seminar we will uh, give you the flyer and uh, okay. two, two weeks later and uh, uh, still the sunday night 8 p.m okay you're welcome to attend us and uh, we will move on we'll make Thank it you. a regular mm -hmm. event Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you, Ben, for putting all this together, mm -hmm. and thank you, Wan Lee and jo Dr. Uh, Joyce Lee, and and Yuha. Are you still there? Are you still here, Yuha? Right? Yes, I'm here. Oh, okay. You any party? Thank words you very much. Any, okay. Thank you very much. I have one message. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Writing is terrible job. It is wonderful to operate on, but to write down is terrible. So it is very difficult. I know only one thing that is more difficult is to is that is to make a database. To make a database is the worst thing. Then writing, scientific writing is coming, and everybody wants to operate on. This is wonderful. This is our life. This is what we are doing and we love to do. But one thing is important. When you write down your experience and publish, you are getting by far better search and research. And this is very important. So you should do, you should learn English, publish in English, write down your experience. And this is big experience in China. You should publish your large series. So thank you very much. Okay, that's a good message to leave on. Thank you everybody. And we'll see you in two weeks. Thank you, John. Thanks to okay, everybody. Victor, thank you, Victor. Thank you. Thanks, thank everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay. We're going to